venture away from. Um, so uh, I can say a lot about him, but I won't, because I'm sure y'all know most of it. But to him, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I do want to say thank you to my pastor showing up today. You did a lot of work today, and I anticipated you going home and doing what you were supposed to do, and that you're here. And so uh, thank you. Thank you, you too. I appreciate it. I need to say something just before I get started. Uh, it's really important to me, and this is kind of a, uh, a big time in my life um, every year around this time. Um, so this past week on Wednesday, my daughter turned 13. Uh, I'm a father of a teenager, and it is driving me nuts. Um, but I myself thir turned 13 this week as well. Um, I have been in the preaching ministry for 13 years. Uh, her birthday, I have to tell you, this, this is just really crazy. So I preached my first sermon December 7th, 2008. Her birthday is December 8th, 2008. Um, so highly important uh, to me as a parent and just what I go through in life. This is, uh, this is the first time that I've been able to stand in my so-called anniversary in two years. Um, and so this is, this is more than just me standing in for you in a time of your need, but this is also you giving me an opportunity in my time of need. And so I'm very grateful for that. Um, you guys have a wonderful pastor. I'm sure y'all know that. So uh, thank you. Y'all bear with me for a second, all right? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that you allowed us to assemble together. We thank you for your greatness. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. God, we thank you that you're sovereign. Lord, now I ask that you, at this moment, Humble me, Lord, that I may hear from you, that I may speak your word, that I may be clear, God, and that the hearts will be receptive. God, that on today your word will go forth and it will change lives, turn someone around, give them an opportunity to hear from you. Don't let just the physical ears be open, but let the spiritual ears be open spiritual eyes to see that your word is what we stand upon and you are who you say you are now God I ask that you would allow me to speak with you on today it's in 
Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. 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 In April 2012, Forbes posted an article of great interest. This article was about a clinical psychologist, Dr. Jennifer Baumgartner, in a book she recently published about a new phenomenon she calls psychology of dress. And her book title is You Are What You Wear, What Your Clothes Reveal About You. It is an attempt to garner the psychological choices of clothing and how the choices affect everyday living in our society. She also states that shopping and spending behaviors often come from internal motivations, such as emotions, experiences, and culture. Dr. Baumgartner also says, you look at shopping or story behaviors, even putting together outfits, and people think of it as fluff. But any behavior is rooted in something deeper. Yeah. I look at the deeper meaning of choices just like I would in therapy. Mm -hmm. Now, this article states that Americans rely on clothing as an economic and a social indicator because there aren't often marks of rank in, or a caste system or an aristocracy. Dr. Barb Gardner also says the idea is that clothes place you into a specified place or where you see yourself. Look at how the reality shows focus on designers and fashions when they start to put each other down. And this is majority on the housewives and all the women start talking about, you know, my fashions, my this, my that. But they're using their clothes and their accessories as a tool to know where they fit in and as a weapon against each other. Yeah. There is an idea that you can judge someone by the clothing that they wear or the shoes on their feet. But the, the, the situation about judging that is that that doesn't always take place. Now, Dr. Baumgartner recommends that when you are trying to do something in life, that you should stick with the basics. She considers the basics as uh, a blazer or the little black dress. Or she even says uh, that it is something like pumps. Um, with the classics, the history has already done work for itself. So that's how we already know that they're classics because the history has already worked for them. So it has multiple functions and it's appropriate for different ages, and different body types, different structures. It's a classic because no matter what, it works. Now on the other hand, there's one piece of style that makes a person look unsuccessful. So the worst clothing is the, the, the clothing that tries to undo or ignore who you really are or what kind of situation you are trying to display. Now, any of these clothing choices can prohibit you from doing the right thing and can send the wrong message. Now, a study was performed by Northwestern University to examine a concept that they called enclosed cognition. Researchers define it as, in their report, as a systematic influence that clothes have on the wearer's psychological processes. Meaning that you are what your clothes are saying about you, and it's not who you are specifically. And how they make you feel. Now, the researchers, they distributed standard white lab coats to every participant, telling some of them that they're wearing a doctor's smock and to the others that they're wearing a painter's smock. Mm -hmm. Now, the ones that they told that they were wearing the doctor's coat were more careful mm -hmm. and more attentive to their actions. Now, they're influencing, uh, their clothing was influencing their actions uh, because it was proof to the idea that you should dress not how you feel, but how you want to feel. Mm -hmm. Now, which clothes that you are wearing make you feel powerful? or in control, or wealthy. The clothes that you choose are sending a message to those around you, but also to yourself. Now, what are you saying to yourself about your clothing choices? And do you find yourself in a dilemma where you need to choose what you are wearing because it's not characterizing who you truly are? Now, if we look in today's text, 1 Samuel chapter 17, we find ourselves in a position where we start to see that there are choices that can be made by the clothing that you wear. All right. Now, I'm going to start reading in verse 32, and then I will skip to 38 and through 40. Um, and you don't have to stand. 
The verse 32 from the New Living Translation says, Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Now verse 38, Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped on the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like. For he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from the stream, put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Now this story begins at the beginning of the chapter as Goliath comes on the scene with the full intent from the backing of the Philistine army to defeat Israel and overtake Saul as the king. <coughs> the problem is the location of the battle. And as we read in the text, they face each other as what the Bible calls hills, but we consider them mountains with the valley between the two. Now, it is the valley of Elah. And there is a stream that runs through this valley for the purpose of the region. Now, where they find themselves in battle is in the land where the, they graze herds and they grow grains. And the climate changes, and it brings about a difference in the valley for each, um, for each season of the year. Now, in the springtime is uh, what is most categorized in the Old Testament as being time for battle. Now, the wintertime is too cold and it's rainy. And in the fall is when they have harvest. In the summertime, it's simply too hot to go fight. So in the springtime is when the year that the, is in the year when most battles happen. And the interesting part about this is neither one of them wanted to choose to engage in the valley because immediate exposure of forces would be detrimental to either side, leaving the ability for them to be attacked from the, from the safety of the mountain. However, we see in the text, Goliath, for 40 days, steps into the valley, exposing himself along with his shield bearer and, and, and to taunt Israel for battle. But because Goliath, a giant of a man, standing over nine feet tall, was it the face of the Philistine army? Israel never attempted to stand against him, thereby staying in place of safety because the giant looked so unrelenting. Mm. Now, how many times have you stood back mm. from the, the task at hand because the giant seems unrelenting? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I can only imagine standing in the presence of, of someone who is almost twice the height of me. I can only imagine what terror this man may have brought upon Israel, knowing that he was the champion of the Philistine army. We understand in the biblical accounts that the word travels and that there is an always an assumption that Israel already heard about this giant and about the track record that he carries. It also makes me think about Saul, the king. Who stands back and does nothing about the giant and his criticisms about the people of God. He showed his cowardice by not stepping out to face the giant. Rather, he tells his army that whoever goes out to defeat him will have a place in my palace. Saul simply offers his daughter as a bride to the victor. And to uh, the man's entire family, they would be free from taxes. Would you stand behind a king who instead of fighting bribes the men that he is around supposed to be leading, he's bribing them to do something that he himself is not willing to do. Come on. <laughs> now would you follow someone who instead of giving leadership sits back on his lofty space and says, now if you go do it and you're successful, this is what you can have. Now for me, not happening. Pablo, if you want me to do something, I need to see you out here doing it too. <laughs> but here in, in, in the text, in comes David, the shepherd boy from Bethlehem. He is the youngest son of Jesse and is responsible for the herds of his father. Jesse sends David to the battlefield because his father is concerned about his eldest sons who are in the army who are being led by King Saul. Now, Jesse sends David with food for his sons, 
and cheese for the <laughs> for the captains. I guess they like cheese, so he's eating <laughs> cheese. Uh, but he sends them, and so he sends uh, Jesse sends David because he wants them to to make sure that his brothers are doing well. But he wants him to come back with a report. He wants to know that everything is going well because here again they've been out here for forty days on a hillside and nothing has been happening aside from this giant out here uh, taunting them and talking about the Lord's people. Yeah. <laughs> now, there are eight sons that are attributed to Jesse. Three of the oldest are here in battle and he sends the youngest who's the shepherd. Now that raises a concern for me because why would he send him into battle? Why would he send the shepherd boy into battle? Now maybe, just maybe, because I can read back through the text, maybe he sent David because he played the harp for King Saul when he was distressed. That happened in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Or maybe it was because Jesse knew that he could trust David with the task because after all, he does tend the flock. And he has been responsible. Or maybe he couldn't uh, he couldn't ask the other sons because maybe they wouldn't have followed his leadership. Maybe they wouldn't have listened to their father and maybe they would have been simply afraid to go and do what he said to do. Mm -hmm. Now we don't know why, but what we do know is David was given a task and he followed what his father asked him to do. Now let me pause here and say that we should also be in the same manner that we can follow the task that our Father asks us to do yeah. without thinking about it, without discussing it, without weighing out the options, whether they're good or bad. Even if it is sending us to, into a territory that is ensuing danger in a battle potentially coming to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe it's time for us to listen up and maybe do what the Father asks us to do the first time yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. so that we can follow his lead. And maybe see some benefit to that. Yeah. Now as David arrives on the scene of the battle. The men are standing around talking about what Saul offered as a reward. To defeat the giant. Rather than discussing what are we going to do to defeat the giant. They're talking about the reward. What, what are we going to get in order to, to defeat the giant from the king. Versus let's just go handle the giant. So how many times do you debate? How many times do you weigh? How many times do you get defeated before the battle even begins? This is why the army of the Lord stood around doing, debating the task. Stood in defeat with the king who chose himself to do what he was doing, which was just sit down. Yeah. But this is also a situation that Israel wanted a king. And this is who they chose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Samuel told them, no, this is not what y'all want to do. And they kept pressing Samuel. We want a king. We want someone. And he said, you know what? Fine. This is who y'all chose. This is who you got. And so as, as an army being led by this man, who is a coward in my opinion, he stands in the way of the Lord doing his work because he is being disobedient. Now, if we flip back through a couple chapters, and I believe this is chapter 9 of 1 Samuel, God spoke to him and said that he would not abandon his people because that would dishonor his name. So we understand that God will step in when man steps away. So David hears the men speaking of this offer of wealth to whomever kills the giant. So David asked again just to make sure he heard them clearly. He's a young man. And he wants to know whether or not he heard exactly what he heard. And his brothers, enraged with the fact that their brother is in the midst of battle, begin to, uh, begin to look down on him. They begin to question him. Like, why are you not tending the little small flock of sheep that you're supposed to be in charge of. Yeah. And why are you even here? What is the purpose of you being here? But David stands up for himself and tells his brother, what, I, what have I done that makes you so angry? 
be, simply because I ask, are you mad because y'all are in a battle and you're not fighting? You're already defeated. What have I done that makes you angry? The only thing that I did was ask a question. And my interpretation of David is, is simply saying, y'all standing around talking about the giant, but ain't nobody doing nothing. Yeah. So if that's the case, we need to really do, uh, talk about what's actually going on. And all the while, the king's men are standing around, and the, the, the Bible says that, that one of the, the king's men went and told Saul, that there's this young man in the camp asking about the reward, and Saul wants to talk to him. Now that brings us to verse 32. Now David stands before Saul and tells him, undoubtedly, I will fight the giant. And this begins a five-verse discourse of Saul and David, where he is defending his capability to defeat and defend the giant based upon what he has seen in the past. David, being the shepherd of his father's flock, must do what is necessary to protect the sheep at all times, no matter the circumstance. The shepherd is, now I'm going to give you a list. He's the guide, he's the protector, the caregiver, the leader, the teacher, the pilot, the navigator, the keeper. In our modern vernacular, the shepherd is the pastor over the flock. So, as, as he explains all of this to Saul, that he has killed a bear that has taken a lamb. And in his explaining, he says, I've killed a lion that has come against my flock. And I have defeated enemies that have come against me. And I have been taken care of what I've been given charge over. So I've been responsible. And he explains the reason for the safety of the sheep is because that is his responsibility to keep his father's flock taken care of. And he has also been a servant of God. David doesn't take lightly that all that he has done has not been in his own might, but it has been through the power of God that lives within him. Now, after this discourse, Saul is content with allowing David to go to battle but before he sends him, he makes him put on his suit of armor. Yeah. 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 Now, when I look at this story, this is the beginning of the end for Saul. <laughs> because as a leader, as a king, as a ruler, instead of him doing what he should have done to lead his people, he allowed someone to come in from outside of his camp to give leadership to those in his camp. And what puzzles me is that, according to 1 Samuel, is that Saul stood head and shoulders above everybody. Now, with this understanding, Saul was a formidable, formidable opponent for Goliath. However, he was just afraid to fight him. And no wonder why no one would stand to fight him, because their leader who was a large stature man, wouldn't even go down there and face a giant. Yeah. And so how can he lead by example when he's not even being an example? Yeah. Now, the key element in this story turns when it takes, again, like I said, when it takes someone from the outside to come in and stand in for him because he was not doing what he was supposed to. Now, that's something for us to also <laughs> take into consideration in our own actions. Don't let someone come in and do something that you are supposed to be responsible for yeah, like, and take over what you're supposed to be doing because you're unwilling to follow God. Yeah. Yeah. Now, back to Saul as being a large stature man. Yeah. His suit of armor that he tried to give David to wear in the battle did not fit him correctly. Because the Bible says that David, a young teenage boy who shepherds his father's flock in the field, was described as being a young, handsome man. It doesn't say that he's a large, handsome man. It just says he's a young, handsome man. And he's a teenager. So I could equate that he's probably not as tall as Saul. He probably carries no stature like Saul. And if I could use my little Holy Ghost imagination... 
I can assume that David probably, I look something like David. Yeah. <laughs> My stature. Yeah. Something about David. Yeah. And it would be like me trying to put on a suit of armor from a man who stands 6'5", six, 6'7". Six, yeah. yeah. He stands head and shoulders. That's how, that's what the Bible says. He stands head and shoulders above those. That means Saul is a very big man. Yeah. Uh, and they liked, now let me tell you all this, Israel liked Saul because he was a champion. He he had a nice figure. He looked good. And so because he looked good, you know, they loved him. Come on. But looking good don't always mean yes. do good. So Saul tries to clothe David in his bronze helmet, his coat of mail that covers his torso, and a sword. And David tries his best to walk and gird himself with armor that he has never worn. And even bare tools, he's never used. David has never put on a helmet before. He's never put on a coat of mail before. He has never drawn a sword out of a sheath before. And so David finds himself in a bit of an identity issue. He was wearing something that was not him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Come on. He was in something that was not him. Come on. And because it was not him, he found himself in a, in, a, in a crisis immediately that he had to get out of. He took one or two steps. That's what the Bible says. He took one or two steps, said, I can't wear these, took them off. So he immediately recognized that I'm doing something that is uncharacteristic of who I am. Let me get out of it and do me the way I know to do me. Now, not only did Saul question his ability to fight uh, but he considered he needed help so by his consideration of him needing help that's why Saul thought it was a good idea for him to put on his armor he didn't know David's uh, availability in, in his fighting techniques he knows he's a shepherd yeah he says that he killed a bear and he killed a lion and he's he's uh, come against the enemies that have come against his flock but Saul didn't know specifically Specifically, So he really tried to push him to a space that was uncomfortable for him. But David had every intention in his heart to do what he knew what was right. So we know that David finds himself getting out of this suit of armor, stepping to Goliath in his own way, and... He did it in his own purpose. Yeah. Now, he stood before Goliath with the power of God on his side to defeat the giant. And he stood before him with the power of the Lord and what he says, the God of the armies of Israel. Now, this is something that's really dear to me, is understanding what David did. David walked from the safety of the mountain to meet this giant in the valley. The giant was already exposed and could have been attacked by Israel, which would have brought the Philistines down the mountainside into the valley, and it would have, the fight would have been soon. But David stepped into the valley with the giant. And he did something amazing to me. <laughs> he did something amazing. He said, I will defeat you in the name of the God of the armies of Israel. Yeah. And as Goliath moved closer, the Bible says David ran towards him. And as David ran towards him, he had his sling in his hand. And he already had a stone ready. And I don't know if you guys know about a sling and a stone. All right. So in ancient biblical times, slings were made. The straps on the sling were two to three feet long, which means you've got a strap on one side of the sling. There's a pocket and then a strap on the other side. Both of them are either two to three feet long. The longer the string is, the greater velocity that you can get. When you release it, the stone comes out faster, right? And so as, as a, a sling uh, bearer, they swing it. 
Once they get up to their speed where they feel comfortable, they release it. Yeah. Well, David, as a shepherd, has spent enough time in the field not doing anything other than watching sheep, so he's had plenty of time for target practice. <laughs> plenty of time. I bet they, they, they say that uh, ancient biblical sling men could hit targets from two to 300 yards away with precision. And so much so in precision that they could hit a target, something like a two by two, uh, a two foot by two foot from three to four hundred yards away. So uh, <laughs> it's amazing to know that David ran towards the enemy with no problems, no problems. Now David would not have had his his ability to fight this giant in his own strength. But he had to do it with the power of God. Now, it was, it was something that, uh, that David took to battle that's really important. The Bible says that he took his shepherd's staff, a sling, and five smooth stones that he retrieved from the stream. If you look at the geological perspective, in where they are, the stones that are in this stream are made of dolomite. Dolomite is a rock that they use to build structures with because it's hard and it's dense. So this is a natural stone that is there. It's not man-made. It's not like a sword. It's not chain mail. This is not a helmet. But it's a stone that is dense. So it doesn't matter how big or how large the stone is. You can have a, a bigger stone that's made out of limestone and it's porous. But this stone is impervious to water, so it's dense. So the five smooth stones that he got were perfect for battle because, again, David has spent his time knowing what he's supposed to do. So he takes this five smooth stones to battle, and he takes the weapon of the war that he has in the proficiency of the stones. And let me tell you, a stone coming out of a sling is running more than 100 miles an hour. And for David to hit Goliath, and to sink a, a stone in his forehead says that Goliath has his armor on. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, the helmets of the time, the only thing that was exposed was the eyes. Where my glasses are is what's exposed. So if David is running towards a giant, he's running. He's slinging this sling. He has one stone and he has that much space to hit. And he hits this giant with one stone. And he collapses this giant to fall. Don't you think that David had every ability to, to be in the presence of God to do exactly what he was supposed to do? Yeah. And when you put yourself in God's presence and you do what he tells you to do, the impossible is yeah. absolutely yeah. possible. Yeah. And so the Bible tells us that David hits him between the eyes. And he falls to his face. He slays the giant. He accomplished that because it was the factor that David was wearing his own armor. The title of my sermon is Wearing Your Own Armor. So when you go to battle, it's important for you to wear your own armor. You wear what it is that you are supposed to wear. Which means you clothe yourself how it is that God tells you to clothe yourself. You be what he says for you to be. You present yourself as what he says you present yourself as. And you can defeat your giants. You can defeat your enemies. You can do whatever you are supposed to do. You can be victorious because you went to battle in your own army. God bless you.